Hello my bags, it's Jade. Welcome to a special video today. We've got a special interview with Julian from Lens Island, a brand new survival game that is out on the 26th of November. It's a top-down, sort of fixed camera point of view, where it's a dungeon exploration game where you can build loads of cozy decorations, make your base into something really unique, and then go and do a bit of sword fighting, taking out Stranger Things style enemies, that's what I kind of view them as, as you gear up, get better loot, better resources, and hopefully go and trade with NPCs. So yeah, small solo dev, project go and give it a wish list right now at least go and check it out or watch some of my let's plays i've already done and yeah i'm really happy to say that i've got julian with me today how you doing i'm great thanks for having me <laughs> yeah no worries no worries so you're in obviously australia 12 hours ahead that's a, a yep. big difference um what's the game dev like in australia i can't say i've heard too much like other than years ago um rockstar and what was it called uh the detective game uh, LA Noir. Yeah, that yeah. was probably the last time I heard of a big sort of Australian studio making waves. Yeah, it's um, it's sort of few and far between the Australian yeah. development scene. Like, uh, it had to, it had its heyday. Like, so about ten years ago, it was pumping when EA was, I think, in Sydney, and we we had a lot of like Sledgehammer and a lot of the the, the biggest studios had sort of satellite offices here and all of that. And it's really just sort of wound back over the past few years. So I think like when I studied game design, there was zero outlook for any jobs. There was just nothing to go into in the industry. Like there was no really avenues forward other than creating your own avenues. And um, and then only just now, I feel like there's a, there's a lot more indies popping up around, around Brisbane, the city that I live in and, and in Sydney and the rest of Australia. There's a lot more indie studios popping up and it's starting to sort of get like this revival, though the revival is through indies and not through the big triple a which is really interesting um melbourne's a little bit different like they are still got the whole triple a scene going on but yeah yes hub. australia has always been a bit of a rocky place for game designers uh it's very hard to find jobs here and maintain a job as well because studios are just opening and closing like opening and closing so quickly yeah and i hear the internet's never that great either <laughs> Compared, <laughs> supposedly Mads, yeah rat bags are like uh, yeah lucky if they get like 20 mb but anyway lens island obviously what is lens island to you what is lens yeah well i guess distilled lens island is just the combination of elements that i like the most in games and then all sort of packaged in you know a nice aesthetic sort of intriguing experience because like what i really wanted was to create a game that a like I was, I was passionate about and then the only game that i'm going to be truly passionate about and invested in making is a game that i'm really interested in so it just combines all the all the facets of game design and mechanics that i'm interested in personally but then it sort of combines a lot of different facets from completely sort of other ends of the spectrum as far as game design like you know when i'm playing diablo i don't usually get to like manage a farm or when i'm playing you know, some are like playing Sims. I don't get to like fight enemies in the dungeons or anything. So it was sort of my attempt at, I guess, co converging a lot of um, sort of mechanics that are usually like the standout mechanics and genres. But then most of the games that attempt yeah. to cross them over don't really do it in meaningful ways or they'll focus on just one or two sort of mechanics and then the rest will all fall behind. So I guess Lens Island is at least our attempt to, to merge all of them in a meaningful way and then package it in something that looks pretty and feels, you know, organic and just feels immersive to sort of be in that environment. It feels makes you feel good, you know. It's a pretty game. Like I, I really love the aesthetic and the art style and stuff. And uh, the top-down view is pretty unique as well. What made you choose that? Uh, funny story. Like honestly, the top-down view was for two reasons. One was the fact that we thought it'd be like easier to develop the game, like um, which in some ways it, it definitely is compared to a third person, first person game. And then the second, the second part was there's something because like my roots come from art. So as an artist, there's something that's really special about crafting top down games because it's sort of like every frame of the game you can hand build like a like a composition, like a painting, like an artwork. So when I'm level designing and set dressing the whole world, because it's none of it's procedural, it's all it's all hand placed by myself. Every oh, right. every single okay. little rock and leaf on the ground, I dragged there and very purposely put it there because I thought it needed to belong there. So it just means that I have a lot of control over what the people see and I can control it in a way that hopefully makes it a more like consistent and sort of pleasing um sort of play through like throughout the game and I can sort of like do a lot of like storytelling and communication through level design that's 
a lot more difficult to do in something where you know the viewport is constantly shifting around and changing so that that's ultimately yeah. why we we started on it and i think the more that we developed within the, the fixed camera angle the more it sort of really grew on me and it it just felt right for the game at first it really was just simple as oh okay I, it, it's probably going to be easy to make the game like this and there's this like rough sort of appeal to to me as an artist but then i feel like as we developed it it sort of became really clear that that's what the game needs and it's sort of the best way you leaned into it yeah yeah definitely yeah i you know what i hadn't really considered that because it is like when you're looking at the, i'm looking at screenshots now on steam and yeah they are it just does look really nice and yeah you do lose that a bit like in an open world game or um you know from third person viewpoint first person you know players are going to be looking at what they want to look at but they won't necessarily have the same kind of vision that you envisioned looking down at the game while you're making it etc but obviously it's not just survival is it you've got to focus on adventure and the farming as well and that looks like it's a really good mix to have yeah i, I look up well i guess you know coming from me yeah I, I, I guess it's a good mix um i guess people can decide that for themselves you know if and when they play the game uh but yeah, yeah. like it's something that I guess the two sort of secret ingredients of Lens Island is a like combine like combining all the genres, you know, because you can you know, make a little farm and then you can home build and then you can explore and then you can you know um, collect large collections of weapons and craft and you know introduce those more survival mechanics. But then you can go down the dungeons that are very very large dungeons and you know effectively play Diablo or play like a dungeon crawler for a little while. And then, like, if one, once yeah. you finish playing your dungeon crawler game, you come back up upstairs and play Stardew Valley for a little bit. You know, like you're sort of jumping between um, these different, like, and even just the visuals and like the mechanics of what you're doing are so different because you know when you're fighting, it's all like really fast-paced sort of timing-based combat and like positional combat, and it's dark and it's a completely different aesthetic. And then when you come up, you know, up into the island and you're building or farming, there's no timer. There's no sort of sense of um, tension or anything you can really sort of do it at your own pace so i think like i the, the number one thing that sort of like burns people out in games is just like repetition of the same thing so i guess lens island was, you know really what i'm trying to do is create that sort of like cyclical game design where you know you go oh okay i need to go craft this sword so you yeah, go craft the sword you go oh wait i should really make some blueberries while i'm at it okay oh no i need iron i guess i'll go down the cave and get iron and then you just sort of lose yourself in all these little tasks for hours and hours and hours because you're sort of just doing like what you're doing life you know setting little goals getting distracted going back to your goals and, yeah and it just it creates such fun emergent gameplay doing it that way and not just doing combat for four hours and nothing else um and, and then maybe changing yeah. up later so like I, look it's what keeps it fun and interesting for me and um and like i've been blown away about the amount of play time that our beta testers have gotten out of the game like i i was sort of always proud about how much play time that we could sort of draw out of Lens Island, but then, you know, I see some of our testers just spending a hundred hundred hours like building crazy homes and and sort of building farming complexes and all this stuff. And it makes you think like, well, like we must we must have something here that works. Like we're probably onto something and I can't wait to expand on that over early access too. Yeah, so that was the thing. I didn't realise it was early access, so I thought it was going to be like a, a finished thing. So that's good to hear. You're going to be updating it obviously as you go and, and adding more features and stuff um and yeah i mean early access is double-edged sword it could be really successful and then um as i've been speaking about recently like certain games are just kind of dropping off a little bit um what what is the plan roughly like do you like is it gonna i know it's it's like asking how big the ocean is but is it a year is it a couple of years do you think you've been early access yeah the the general time frame is two years you know give or take most yeah. likely give realistically and um and we have like a lot of sort of big ticket items like one of the main things is like we we made Lens Island as a single player game um, from the get go, but we always had the idea of maybe adding multiplayer in the future. But throughout making the demo and throughout development so far, it's easily the number one requested feature is to add co-op. So that's on the right. timeline is to add multiplayer at some point. Um, oh, that's great news! That's great. A lot news. of ideas for multiplayer. Some. Um, I think we can do some. I think we can do one better than just the typical co-op survival aspect. I think. Right. I think that will work in Lens Island, and it could be good. Though I've got some other ideas to make it a bit more interesting and sort of dynamic, and like add something new to gameplay rather than just sort of supplementing what's already there. So yeah, like that's right. one of the big ones, and then that will sort of really be dictated by the community. I'm, I'm sort of 
you know, six months from now when we're going smooth and, and, and putting out content updates and all that, I'll probably, you know, make a video essentially asking everybody, hey, you know, <laughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> here's, here's, here's the plan. Um, pick which one, pick which route you want to go down. Uh, but yeah, and then it's really just extrapolating on what we have because I feel like we have some good foundations for a game and, and it's it's fun and it's engaging. So I really want to take it from just sort of, you know, like good farming and, and good good fighting and good building and I want to make it like fantastic. Like I want the building system to be the best building system and the farming system to be the best and the combat to be the best. Like I don't want, I don't want it to be a bunch of average features combining to make it an average game. I want to be a bunch of amazing features that you never get in one game and because usually they focus on you know one feature that's amazing and everything else is just sort of okay um so mm -hmm. it's just like yeah content 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 more worlds more places to fight you know you get teleporting to completely different islands and um having completely different sort of more building options more farming options like really going in depth with the building and farming system adding questing into the game having npcs living on the island with you like that there's we have a whole massive backlog of features that some we have already started developing that are in the pipeline, just ready to go. So early access is essentially just us making Lens Island, not from just the original vision and now going, okay, now we're going to make our dream game. Like we're going to make this a game that can we compete can with the AAA titles and can really like shine through the industry. So that's what early access does is it gets us to that point. And hopefully everyone can see that yeah. from now and see like how much potential it has. And, um, and just like come along with a ride with us. That's good. That's really good to hear, actually. Yeah, I did, I hadn't realised that. Oh, I thought it was just going to be a, a stock sort of single player game. So to hear that, that's like one of the first sort of things you're looking at potentially and stuff. And that's good because you know, yeah, cozy farmers and uh, builders and and games like these, they do definitely benefit when you can get friends to play mm. with you or or, or or some way to have that kind of interaction with others. Um, I mean, they can be great as well, but we've all seen it from games like Animal Crossing, showing off your island to other players is important. And then just other co-op games in general, like survival, is one of them things that lends itself even more. Like people, it is every time I see or release a game video talking about a new game, the top comment will be, has it got multiplayer? Is, is it going to have like co-op? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's good to know. Good stuff. With the kind of system like you've got, so you've got the base building. Like, how did you decide to do that? Because obviously you said you had kind of an artistic vision for this top-down view, but then the base building allows players to really customize and, and do what they want with it. So did, was there any point where you thought you might just have static homes that you might just have as like your base uh, like you designed explicitly? Or was it always the way to have like these options modules that players can mess around with? Yeah, it was definitely always, like the modular building system was definitely always the plan. I think like the, the roots of Lens Island date back to around sort of 2015, 2016, when I was sort of, working on a, a few prototypes and game projects and like one of the prototypes i made was recreating the building system from rust and i just sort of made that in my, in my spare right. time because i loved rust i love those sorts of games and um and i've always loved modular building and just just allowing a creative outlet for for home building my one problem with rust is that like it serves like such a, a perfect need of like you know the utilitarian version of home building it's like you're building a, a base you're not building a home because you need to actively yes. defend. It's a, it's a castle. And that's really cool. And it's so perfect for us. But I was like, oh, I wonder if we can sort of get this same system, but then apply it in a way where, you know, that's not a worry. And you can you can just make it exactly how you want to make it. There's no defenses. There's no nothing. Um, but then finding out a way to still have those high moments of tension and the fighting. Um, and, and that's sort of like how we decided on having essentially a secluded island that there's no enemies. There's nothing that can hurt you. Nothing's going to knock on your door in the middle of the night. And then there's like all these dungeons down below and some smaller islands off the coast that you can fight stuff on. And we're actually sort of drawing a hard line in the sand between those two types of gameplay. Because in my opinion, like the home building and farming gets to really, really flourish when it doesn't have this sort of like cloud of, of tension over the top the whole time being like, oh, you know, it's a nice farming yeah. building, but you should probably build it in a specific way. Otherwise, a horde of zombies will break it down. Um, or you know you better finish it before the sun sets otherwise you're going to get killed or something like it's it's there's nothing more annoying than trying to get you know pushed along when you're making a game and the game's sort of forcing you to go okay hurry up like do this so i can sort of get to the next phase and um i want people to be able to take a break from the high attention and take a break for as long as they want 
and 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 just really decide where they want to put their time in the game and the game won't punish you for putting your time more so in any place and that's something it's like really built into the foundations of the game too like you can make the game way way easier for yourself if you focus on farming a building and make a whole bunch of money being like a farming mogul and then you can just buy amazing weapons if you're not as you know confident with combat you might you might not want to go into the dungeon straight away so you can sort of make that process easier for yourself um and do the things that you like and I'll, then get rewarded for it i like that approach it is cool because yeah some people really do like loving cozy builders at the moment loving co cozy farmer games where that's all you do like it's just about establishing your base and, and growing your crops and stuff but then yeah having that option to go and look for a bit of danger or a bit of excitement and not have it invade your home is is good as well like you know this isn't maybe going to be a game that a lot of rust players will pick up <laughs> but certainly a lot of survival and farming which is huge at the moment and what i will say lens island like the creature design is great like uh, you know i keep saying it as a reference it's lazy but I, you know it's an easy one is stranger things style enemies is that fair or yeah, where did uh, you get your inspiration from the working name for all those enemies were demi gorgons and that's what like what right. all the community decided their <laughs> names were pretty pretty quickly as well so I, i'm totally I'm, I'm totally open to everybody's interpretation um of all the enemies but yeah we wanted to go with a very specific aesthetic and, and look and feel and that's definitely tied to the whole story and why those enemies are there and why they look like they do and and why the dungeons are there and where they exist and everything there's like um there's a big story behind lens island and we're sort of we're hinting at it all throughout the, the early access release like you could you can piece bits of it together and um and we'll, as we continue to expand upon the caves and like questing and all these other elements of gameplay, I'm really excited to sort of double down on that and really try and dig into the story and sort of let people know why this world exists and why things are the way they are and and all of that. Because it, I think it's, I think it's a pretty cool sort of setting that we've come up with over time. And it's all been sort of very finely figured out over time. It's taken a lot of sort of deliberation. So the the enemies fit into that absolutely. And um, yeah, a lot, a lot of care, a lot of time. They've gone through a lot of iterations too. They weren't always what they are now. They, they started off a little bit more like horror sort of game enemies, like a bit more sort of Slender Man, like Babadook, if, if everyone knows what Babadook right. is, like a bit more sort of walk around a corner and then like this tall, scary, like jump scare figure Just pop walks out. Of out. Yeah. And then I think because that's at the start, we wanted to lean really heavy into the the caves is like a horror game and then above is like a you know a farming game but i think it was just it was too polarized too heavily like it was almost like we're making it scary just for the sake of it so then we sort of dialed it back a little bit and then you know decided to go less scary and just more interesting and more sort of in depth um and that that's where the enemies came from that you see now They've got like a real. I, I love the aesthetic. I do just like the eyes, the way they glow on the tendrils, whatever they are sticking out on some of them. And then yeah, like I got surprised today by a great big sort of grey red Hulk protected by like these mini crab like creatures. <laughs> so they, they seem fun as well. Like it's not all just really dark and black ominous shapes coming out. We are like the Lovecraft in aspect in a few games lately has been there definitely. Like where we've seen like tendrils and tentacles and stuff and got a little bit of a vibe from some of the creatures like that obviously you've got like the corruption style in some of the caves um where you're going along and you know it's just littered everywhere and i like that vibe it's it's a it's a real nice um mix or, or, or juxtaposition i think that's yeah. the right words yeah. between that and then the cozy farming aspect and then like the pretty houses and the the nice manicured farms you've got in the cozy countryside exploring the island to then having this sort of darker undertone yeah oh well that it's perfect that you think that because um that yeah that was the goal that that's the plan so and even like what you've probably seen so far like there's we're only going to expand upon that so that the um the the aesthetics and sort of the the settings of the caves and everything will change as you go further deeper so at, at the moment yeah. at release there's effectively like two two and a half zones that we call them um which is sort of like different segments of the cave uh and then the, the the final finished version of lens island will have five different zones so the caves will be more right, or less okay. sort of three times bigger than what they are now um and there'll be okay. a lot more bosses and a lot more things sort of along the way as well and on top of that there'll also be another juxtaposition with the above ground world as too because we want to add in a whole other island and a whole other world that you can sort of be switching between and come back and forth um, i think that's what like makes minecraft so good is like having like the nether and having those worlds that you can just sort of teleport into and 
they're just so different in every way and just sort of being able to flip between yeah. those different moments of gameplay and it's like you said it's just that juxtaposition that keeps things fresh and interesting and um that that's what we definitely want to do we definitely want to like really lean on that and trying to keep things fresh and interesting and also just like as a way for content updates too there's nothing worse than like yeah. a content update that just adds more of the same thing so we want to keep you know providing people with stuff that is is interesting and is new and, and is something to really sink their sink their teeth into and get excited about so that's that's hopefully what the roadmap's going to look like is sort of constantly adding in some some new areas and some new sort of bits and pieces that people um won't necessarily expect to see or expect to experience that's i guess that's part of the like the loops of the end game i mean it's not it's not a diablo game where necessarily it's going to be about min maxing character stats fully and, and killing billions of creatures through millions of dungeons but it has got them aspects of trying to get better loot or better gear or, or being able to upgrade yourself to make life a bit easier i guess yeah for sure and i think that that's something <laughs> i think we definitely probably put a bit more time into the the complexity of the combat and the um and the item collection and stuff then we probably should have it, it's turned out to be right. like an amazing combat and and sort of weapon system but it's like unbelievably complex like i i um i don't think people like it's yeah like there's you could i'm not going to name names or anything but there's so many games that you know are just just fighting games and do nothing else than you know running through and killing big bosses and um and our, uh, the, all the systems we made are like unbelievably more complex and detailed than those games that are just fighting games. And I think that's probably maybe even yeah. a bad thing, but sometimes, it, well, a bad thing for us developers because it just means we get so much less sleep making all these features that we're sort of promised. Um, but it's a good thing for the yeah. players because it means that people probably expect pretty surface level combat and like weaponry system from a game like Lens Island. And then they play it and they realized it, it's very deep. And like, you know, there's around, I think around 70 or 80 weapons at launch. Oh, really? Yeah. I did not, again, I did not know that. I was I was looking around and I'd, I'd seen some, some basic sort of tools you can make. And I guess that's all part of the progression system is is getting better equipment and, and, and finding ways to find, buy them from the NPCs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think what we've really gone for is like, there is like um, progression, but the main thing, the main form of progression in Lens Island is really the progression of the player playing the game because some weapons are objectively better than others though the the biggest amount of pull of probably like i don't know 70 percent of the weapons are really just different like they're all just different kinds of weapons and they've got a lot of personality like there's probably i think it's around 40 different abilities like shared between all the different weapons and probably 50 different attacks wow. and okay. things and those are all spread out in completely different ways and have sort of different um ways that they're sort of utilized throughout all the different weapons so you could sort of pick up something and go, oh, this is really cool. Like, I like this sword for these reasons. And then you'll find a hammer and you go, oh, this sort of caters to a different play style. So people can, it's sort of like each weapon has a personality and people can become attached and sort of teach themselves how to use that weapon and then move on to the next item. And it's like this fresh, interesting new experience. So I think I've, I've, I'm pretty proud of like the whole combat system we did um, because it's definitely set Lens Island up for the rest of its future to sort of have that as a, as a really strong foundation of a mechanic that that already is quite in depth and works well and then we have this whole critical hit system with the timing and abilities and we have this what yeah. i feel like is a pretty tight-knit system and and um and then once we add you know bows and ranged weapons and all these other aspects to it it's going to become like really in depth like way more than what anyone's going to expect out of a game like lens island so well, i'm pretty excited yeah for, for sure <laughs> that's that's surprisingly good news. I noticed that as well. Like when I was harvesting stuff, you've got that critical point where it reminded me, yeah, as I mentioned in my video, um, of Rust. You know, you've got to hit the X on the spot or yeah. you've got to time it right. So it, it makes harvesting not not just a monotonous one button hold. You actually, if you want to do it a bit quicker or better, timing it right and, and having like that little mini moment um, to get better hits is, is, is something interesting. Yeah, exactly. Because like especially usually like farming and harvesting resources in games is quite monotonous and usually it just comes down to like a time investment it's like the, the more time you invest the more resources you get out and it's very rarely skill based it's rev it, it's rarely like a mechanic that actually um sort of you know congratulates you if if you're more skilled at it so this the crit system was our attempt of actually making it more of a skill based system getting resources that requires some more active input from the player so if if you want to 
you can try and get your crits and you will chop a tree quicker and you will get more wood for it and you'll get rewarded. And it's the exact same system with the combat too. Is like you can just sit there and click away and you'll do some damage. But if you learn the weapon and learn the time frames and, and, and get to know it, you'll be able to hit the crits consistently, get rewarded and do a lot more damage and just be a better fighter. But that's always available to you. Like that's not capped at any skill or anything like that. Um, so that's what I think is, it, it's just sort of nice because it's, you, you really feel like you're growing as a person when you play the game because the skill is essentially your own skill and your own knowledge of the weapons and tools that you're using. And when you become better at them, you become better at the game. Um, I've like, I, I always steer more towards like fluidity in, in sort of difficulty in games where people get to sort of choose their own difficulty, um, in more of a fluid way where they might not even realize they're choosing their own difficulty and for me like that's like such a yeah. perfect thing in game design is the people that just inherently play games in a certain way that game can help cater to that play style because of the systems are made in a certain way and people that just want to like get into the thick of it and make it really hard like it will be hard and it will sort of recognize that and um and like the game just sort of responds and does sort of what you need it to do rather than just like you know, a button in a menu being like, okay, I'm going to play the game in hard mode and now everything does double the damage. Um, it's, right. it's always felt like a little bit of a yeah. cop out to me, that sort of style of game design. So yeah, like this, I, I guess we've tried to eliminate all of that and make it cater to everybody and try and be a bit more fluid. I like games like that. I hate it when, um, you know, the min-maxers that you have to always use that one particular weapon or armor. Otherwise, you know, you're not really going to progress through the game as quickly or, or as better as other players. Mm. And I like the idea when you've got choices that just give you the option to use certain weapons because you just like the look of it. You know, it's it's rather than <laughs> yeah, exactly. it has to be the, the max. I think we're all yeah, guilty of, of picking items that are worse that just simply look better. Good. What's going on with the sort of, obviously, early access? Any tentative plans for any other platforms? Yeah, like, definitely tentative. Um, I know Switch has always been on our radar, and then I guess now Steam Deck mm -hmm. too, now that that's sort of come onto the playing field. Um, I, I think yeah. the game really would work well on a, on a, on a handheld device like Switch. Um, we would never go mobile, uh, but Switch and console uh, are absolutely avenues that we'd be keen to, keen to explore. And yeah. uh, we've, been, we've been sort of getting the game ready behind the scenes. As we've de been developing it, um, we've always had in mind this could be played on a console one day or, or a Switch or a Steam Deck. So we've been making certain decisions and doing things in certain ways to make that viable. And, um, and we'll be adding in a console right. support pretty soon after release as well. And then the plan would be sort of once we're ready um, and once the game is, is what we feel we're comfortable, we would absolutely love to. But it's really just a contingent on w doing it right. Like I don't want to... I don't want to rush onto a console. Like, you know, someone could offer me as much money as I want and I'm not going to off I'm not going to release Lights Island a day earlier than I wanted to <laughs> on a console or, or anything because I just, right. I, I want to make sure that it's a good experience. So right now we're just focusing on making a, a perfect experience on, on Steam and PC and Mac. And then once we've nailed that in, we're confident that we've got like a, a really nice experience that we're proud of, then we can start sort of duplicating that and making those experiences on other platforms. But I don't want to just like cheaply and, and sort of hastily port it to, to console or switch or something. And there's like all of these sort of like, you know, holes and all these things that are sort of, you know, oversights. Like I really want to do it properly. And I want to, you know, make sure like the, the, the UI and the ease of access and everything is just perfect. And it's, you know, if you're, if you're picking up on a switch for a first time, or you're picking up on Steam for the first time, um, you're not sort of shorthanded depending on what platform you pick. Like you will have the same experience. You'll have an experience that's had as much t care and time put into making sure that that experience will, will work properly. So ab absolutely yeah. would love to go down that path. I, I just have no idea when that will be. Um, but, but like it's absolutely, it, yeah. it's on our radar and it's on our sort of priority list. Once, once we're comfortable, once we're ready. I could definitely see lens island on switch for sure and yeah you're right i think definitely sometimes when port jobs get done by publishers other publishers and stuff they're frankly it's just not that great and then the, the best games that i've played uh that have appeared on consoles 
are often by the developers themselves, like when they've done it themselves and not not sourced it yeah. out to someone else. Like the Forest on PlayStation is one of the best survival games going, and so you just had to wait a longer time for that, and they did it themselves, and that was great. So yeah, definitely, I feel like sometimes it's better to have that because um, if you do port it out, not always. Uh, there are great companies out there, but I just it's definitely something about a developer doing it themselves. So even if it takes a bit longer, and I guess controller support, you said you're going to be maybe adding that in in future for yeah. PC because uh, at the moment it's just keyboard and yeah, mouse so yeah there's um like a mouse base input scheme sort of like reminiscent of you yeah. know mobas and things and then there's a wasd mm -hmm. scheme as well for people that prefer that um it definitely was made for, for the yeah. mouse scheme and it's always interesting seeing people pick it up for the first yeah. time and sort of going like, oh this is this is interesting uh because people don't really expect it but then sort of after typically after half an hour people forget that they're playing with a scheme that they, they probably you know don't usually play with or at first they might not like and then they go, oh, okay, and that just feels natural. Like, I was even watching a streamer play it this morning. And, yeah, he's like, Maybe I need to stick with it more because I switched it to the <laughs> that, WASD within that's minutes. That's there. Look, and we have plenty of beta <laughs> testers that have been using the WASD throughout, and they really like it. And it's just people's preference at the end of the day. Yeah. I would definitely say, like, as a developer, I would recommend the mouse input just because it is yeah, more... Yeah, just... just yeah like it. but it just you've got to get past that little barrier of like oh this feels a bit weird but at the end of the day like you know use whatever you want to use like we're just providing you the tools whatever ones you want to use that's completely up to you it's just the mouse input is a bit more fluid and precise um the wasd like the right. reason why people sort of like that is because it's, it's very like definitive it's like you know my w key will send me perfectly upwards and my, my d key is, is exactly right and it's all on perfect angles and it's it's very and it's also like i guess some so like i would consider it more strenuous but I, I guess other people consider it less strenuous you know moving with those keys and the mouse um but like yeah yeah look it's up to you it's up to anybody that's why we have it <laughs> and i'm a console kid yeah, anyway okay. so like getting used to pc playing for the last few years has always been a bit of a challenge but i love torchlight and i remember um playing it on the xbox 360 great game amazing uh, torchlight 2 or whatever it was and then i got to pc and i thought all oh, right i can pick up the sequel now or talks like to like properly and i'll play it and it had the controls of just the mouse yeah. and it took me such a long time <laughs> to get used to i really I, it's one of them but yeah i guess with the game obviously you, you, how many people have worked on this game like you know how long has it been in development so development started just for myself about i would like so it really started four or five years ago but then like development officially started i'd say three and a half years ago um when I when it went from just sort of some random prototypes and concepts, you know, sort of like sporadically put together to sort of like a, a formed idea. So I was like, okay, I've got this game. I'm going to call it Lens Island. I'm going to start working on this game now officially. Um, and then I it was just me working on it for the first sort of year and a half. And then my old my old university lecturer who actually taught me programming, um, Martin. He I got him on board. I basically met up one night for dinner. I was like, hey, look. He actually just got a job offer to make casino games for tons of money. <laughs> and um, he ended up sort of giving up that to, to work on Lens Island with me. And it's effectively been two developers oh, wow. the whole time. So it's just myself and Martin making the game. We've had some helping hands with like um, music composing and, and bits of artwork here and there. And and then like bits of help with um, a couple of sort of like graphics programming and shaders. But there's, yeah, there's, there's two of us in a room all day, every day, just developing the game. Um, and... Yeah, look, I, it's it's hard work. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't suggest it to anybody. Okay. Uh, but it, yeah, like we managed to sort of get this far, so I'm pre I'm pretty proud of what we've done because that was literally the the original drive and motivation for Lens Island. Seen as it started off with just me making it, was I wanted to prove to myself that I could pick a vision that was absurd and too grand to really be realistic, and somehow accomplish it. It was like a really addictive challenge for me because I've I've always sort of been of that nature and um, and it was something where I was like, I want to prove to myself that I'm sort of possible at doing this. And then naturally over the project, it just sort of evolved to become something so much bigger than I ever would have thought it would be. And I, I sort of come to learn that that just is sort of what emerges out of, you know, passion and, and sort of, you know, lack of compromise and, and hard work. It's like if you get a couple of people that are highly passionate, highly motivated, and, and put all their time into something, um, like something will just emerge that has a lot of value. You know, whatever they're working on, it will it will be good. It doesn't matter because they're, they're doing all the right things to set them up. And I think that's sort of 
what we fell into. Like I didn't expect Lens Island to, you know, be in the top 50 Steam wish lists of all games and, and sort of like be at the top of the Steam Next Fest and, and sort of be smashing all these AAA publishers and all this sort of stuff. Like I, I had no idea that that would even be achievable for us. Um, but it just sort of happened <laughs> over time. So I, I guess it's, it's been really nice for, it's been really nice to sort of see that too. We're just sort of two humble developers that have never released a, a proper game before. We've just had a lot of drive and a lot of motivation and we sort of just persisted. And literally Lens Island was just built on like, like just blood, sweat and tears and just hard work and diligence and goal planning. And, you know, that that's sort of what got us here. But it's effectively a two man team. And then we have, you know, three people that have just helped out in, in, in little areas here and there part, part time. I like like Lars, who's made all the music, is has just been a like a gem. Like the 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 whole music composing for for, for Lens Island, I'm just oh, it, I'm just obsessed with it. Like I absolutely love the soundtrack that he's put together, and it's really really special. It is great. Like in the early parts, I've been playing as well. Like it is, it's just nice. It's got that vibe to it. Where sometimes even the best music after a while gets irritating, but I haven't had that so far with Lens Island. Like it's just there in the background. It's not too brash. It's not too quiet. It's it's just about the right level. Mm. Yeah, well, that's fantastic, and and that really was the plan, you know. And uh, I think being just two developers making a game, there's naturally going to be a lot of holes and in knowledge and skills and what we're allowed to put our time into so having a couple of helping yeah. hands to fill those because like you know daniel who's made all the amazing splash art and made some icons and things for the games here and there he's just sort of helped started helping out in the past like sort of last couple months of development most recently and then lars has been making music and sounds the whole time and we've had another person ivan who's helped out a little nice. bit with with shaders and things so he's helped make the water look as good as it does and for example so like um being just two developers it's really really helped having those people that with like specialized skill sets being able to come in and provide a little bit of help yeah. every so often to fill those gaps because yeah without that like it would be the same experience but it definitely would feel like a far less polished and sort of tightly packed experience i think i think a lot of the polish of lens island we definitely owe to having those helping hands outside martin and i now, have you ever so obviously one of the things i noticed like on twitter following you was like you're pretty outspoken about like um refusing sort of publisher help like it's, it's basically <laughs> published by yourselves yeah um and I, I admire that i really like that i mean i feel like yes we all know t tales of small indie games doing well like stardew valley or whatever and they all did it pretty much mostly on themselves maybe except when it came to like console ports and stuff it's still just good to see like some devs really want to make their game their way and and not bow down to um not the big bad of publishers they're not all awful uh, i use that term loosely but um but th there's a big majority out there that kind of really do kind of rinse out a lot of of smaller productions and you know you see these games come and go and just die and fall off a cliff because that's it they don't own the rights to them as much or, or they just can't do it has your experience been with publishers and what made you really choose to just carry on doing it on your own yeah like i, I think we're pretty adamant like well, at least as me personally um because i had you know founded the studio and sort of you know the lead game designer so i don't really have anyone to, to answer to like it's a very collaborative environment but sort of being um sort of i guess the captain of the ship it sort of made me realize just how much um there is how much uh sort of responsibility i have um and the responsibility i see is to is to make a great game and make the game that we're sort of wanting to what we're sort of promising to everybody and then sort of making that expectation a reality and anything that can, you know, jeopardize making that great game is, is a problem. And, you know, if someone's going to tell me who to hire or where to put my money or what game mechanics to include or not include, um, or even like make parts of the game for me or anything like that, like that in my eyes is, is a massive problem. Like that's something that will really, really jeopardize it. And, um, and like, yeah. and I'm also, you know, we're, we're trying to build, we're trying to build Lens Island, but I'm trying to build a, a game studio, you know, like, I'm trying to build a livelihood here. Like I, I'm not just trying to build a product that makes me a bunch of money and then just like live on an island somewhere. Like I'm, I'm trying to build Flow Studio and I want to you know give people jobs in my local area because, like I was saying, you know, game designs is, is it's a bit rough times in where I live in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, I, I you know went to university and I know a lot of amazing game designers that sell cars and make coffee because there's no jobs in game design and I want to give those people jobs and I want to build a workplace that you know fixes hopefully sort of fixes all the problems that there are in the game design industry so like and yeah. publishers and all of that like they just kill that vision you know the the, the second that happens yeah. it's really going to make it difficult but it's been interesting like you know 
it's been interesting getting all the emails from like the big players, like literally the biggest players in the game industry, like all of the biggest publishers that have sort of knocked on our door. And I just sort of give them the old, like, no, no deal. <laughs> and um, it's just, yeah, like it feels pretty good, but I've just, it's just, it's been my opinion the entire time. And like, I don't care, like, I don't care what the offer is. Like if you, if, if they want, and like a lot of them are, are, are just terrible offers as well. <laughs> like a lot of them, I'm, I just, I just yeah, go, I bet. man, like do people accept this garbage? Like, wow. But, but so some of them I'm sure would make me a lot of money and like may, maybe sort of kickstart the studio a little bit. But then at the same time, um, I wouldn't, you know, I might not be the majority shareholder of the studio anymore. Or, you know, like Lens Iron will end up being a very different game. It's going to become like the Fortnite and all that. And like, it's just, it's just not what I want to do. Like, uh, I'm here trying to sort of set out to build a life for myself and build a life for other creatives and game designers that are all part of our team. And like, yeah, the people on our team, I want to give them jobs and give them a future. And I want to, like all the stuff that I hate about the game design industry, I want to sort of make that do it differently with flow studio and the only way i can do that is by you know like paying staff well and spending a lot more money than what other game design studios spend and the only way i'm going to get that extra money is by not giving it to a publisher and making a good game yeah. so it's like I, yeah like we, we ha i have a lot of big plans and simply put like a, a publisher is not going to make those plans happen they're just sort of going to hold them back um no. as well as that like you know with publishers people i, I think the trap that a lot of game designers fall into is they overvalue publishers and like the expertise and skill sets because like ultimately most of the job of publishers these days is marketing and porting you know like the big thing is marketing right. it's like they sort of go hey like here's your game we we think it's a cool game like you know we we believe in your vision um but you're just a random person like nobody knows you nobody knows your game we're going to put it on e3 and we're going to get get you a hundred thousand wish lists and we're going to do all this stuff and then you're going to sell the game and like, yes, that's great. And then like, maybe that person wouldn't have got to that stage, but they absolutely can get to that stage without a publisher. Like all the stuff that like, I think people sort of have this idea that um, publishers have all of these like unique opportunities that nobody else does. And they're going to all these secret people that do these secret marketing techniques. And these, it's just like, no, it's just all, they're doing all the same stuff everybody else does. Like you could just do a marketing course. Now you're a publisher, like, you know what they're doing. Um, cause like my experiences yeah. in marketing, like I, I started from graphic design and photography, and then I sort of started in a, in a marketing role. I was a marketing director for a company, ended up being COO. And I understand how, like, I understand like how to financial plan and how to like, you know, I was going over to China and releasing products and, and marketing them and selling, like, I understand how that whole business side works. And it's really not as difficult as I what guess people think. And I think so many Indies have the power to go really, really far on their own and not spend a single dollar. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of, it's like this sort of like murky water where people don't understand that that's a possibility. And publishers sort of tell you, we make that a possibility, um, which they can, but also yeah. like, you know, you're paying for it and you could easily do it yourselves to an extent. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I guess there are some devs that just haven't got that kind of extra experience, and and so when they're they maybe focused on just making the game, or they're they're just a programmer, or they're just a designer, like it must be hard for them to really view it and go right. I you know I can't do this on my yeah. own. But well, they, they uh, yeah, yeah, it's because it's it's gate kept. Yeah, there's too much info that's not revealed, like in the game industry. I yeah. feel like there's not enough um, sharing of technologies and ways to do stuff and uh, especially with indies as well like it's really hard to get that kind of experience from others sometimes um it's getting better with social media and blogs and, and things the way that people can communicate how they built their game and and stuff but it's still quite a, a, a guarded industry you know of, of how to, who you know and what you know and how to get stuff on and and some of the platforms don't make it easy like playstation the way you have to pull stuff over and so it might seem really tantalizing to have someone that says oh yeah we know all the loops to get you onto a, a ps network or, or the xbox live and stuff but ultimately yeah just like anything if you can spend a bit of time researching and learning you probably figure out you won't need that additional help and certainly won't need to spend you know 50 or 60 percent of your uh, income on on the publisher's returns yeah um I, to get that stage and i think you sort of like 
defined it really well is like yeah it's the the like publishers can be amazing and they you know we have a lot of publishers to thank for amazing games although it's not like a one size fits all and it sort of seems that way for most yeah. people from from you know game designers sort of seem to have this idea that it's a, it's a one size fits all just from lack of knowledge and awareness and transparency throughout the in- industry but like i've talked to plenty of heads of studios myself and like for them, publishers are a godsend. It's like, hey, I've got a family with kids and I've got people to feed and I, I need to keep a roof over my head. I'm not like uprooting my life and risking it all to make this game. Like that's not what I'm trying to do. Like I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, get my, get my wage and build a cool game and keep going forward with my life. And people have different motives and different goals and different headings. And that's, you know, there's, there's some people like I was also just lucky that I was in a good job that was getting paid well and I saved up my money for a couple of years and then we had the Kickstarter and then I've just funded all of Lens Island through my savings account and, and through Kickstarter. Um, the Kickstarter money runs out very, it's... very quickly. <laughs> but, you know, like I, yeah, I, I, I sold my car recently to just pay bills for Lens Island. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, I saw like, that. Not everyone's prepared yeah. to do that. Not everyone should do that. Like, you know, if, if you'll just it'll make you sleep easier at night, just, just go go for a publisher, but just pick the right one and, and pick one that's sort of transparent and it really has your best interests at heart because I guess my my experience has definitely been a little bit biased, really just from the fact that, you know, Lens Islands, it's done, it's finished. And I'm getting publishers still to this day knocking on our door and emailing me, being like, hey, blah, blah, blah. Like they're trying to like give us all these deals. It's like, like, like why? We can help you get like, seen. Like, I've literally, I remember sending a publisher back an email and they're like, hey, we just like, they were sort of bragging about all these successful games that they're like about to release. I was like, like we're higher, and it's reply back to hey, we're currently higher on the wish lists than all of those games, and I haven't spent, I spent zero dollars on marketing. So, like, what can you do for me? Yeah, and um, and it's just like it's just true. Yeah. Like, it's just like it, unfortunately, that's that's the case. Or like they're just trying to get an easy slice of the pie. Like they see Lens Island is like, oh, it had a Kickstarter, it has that sort of market verification. People want it. People, it's sort of being verified as a product that can work. And then, oh, they've almost finished developing it, so it, it's a very small risk. And it's really high up on the wish list. And, you know, that's just further verification that people want this game. And we it takes nothing from us. It takes like we just slap on $100,000 in marketing budget and put it in the right places. And that's it. Job done. Dust our hands, make our millions. And that's like, that's the problem with, with publishers. Like when they become that sort of leech mentality. From the, from the start, yeah. if it's like, you know, I'm pitching my idea to a publisher and I maybe have a prototype and I'm going, hey, I want to quit my job and start the studio and I need you to give me half a million dollars and they in order to do that that stuff is really special like that stuff it's like investment capital you know it's like a publisher making yeah. your business a reality making that idea a reality and that stuff i'm absolutely for like that is amazing um but a lot of the publishing deals that you see these days are people that are just like a random person on twitter that has been is really passionate making a cool game and they're posting youtube clips and tweets and things about their game getting a lot of awareness and then they're they're already ahead of the game. Like they're already their marketing efforts without spending any money have already sort of catapulted their game into the forefront. And then that's when they get all the, the that's when they get all the publishers being like, oh, okay, here's a really easy sale for us. Um, and like that's the problem yeah. is that sort of like really sort of like prey behavior because the second you get high on the wish lists, there's people like there's just, there's so many companies like digital agencies and, and producers and just everyone like everything. Anything that can be like outsourced in game design, there's people just watching the stop the top wish lists on Steam and just emailing every single one of those games, being like, "Hey, blah blah blah, we love your game. Yeah. We we want to get a slice yeah. of that." And it's just like, and it's just nonstop. And the higher you got that that the higher you got that ladder, the more of those emails that you get. And there's people that are on that ladder, like us, that haven't spent a dollar on marketing, and we we've just got up here through you know executing a game plan, <laughs> and um, or sometimes just by luck. And, um, and you don't, you don't need, you don't like from that point, it's like, just, just do it yourself. Like you don't need anyone. Like you're, you're in a way better position. No. I guess that's the, the best advice you can give for a, a, an aspiring dev and stuff. What can, um, something like I uh, try and ask cause gamers, you know, what can they do more to help indies if they really want to get behind these sort of games like Lens Island and, and support them? What, what is the biggest thing a gamer or viewer or player can do? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think probably two things like one thing is a- approaching games from the mindset that like this the games that you're playing are made by people like they're, they're not just like this faceless corporation like they there's people like there's someone sitting there crafting this experience that you're playing and they have emotions and they have a livelihood 
Um, you know, in our case, it's like we're two people that have risked, uh, like, I, I just sort of like really taken a lot of downfalls in our life to make this game, you know, like our lives are very, very significantly impacted by making Lens Island. So I think, um, like, not really, not really like sympathy or empathy or anything. It's well, I guess not sympathy, but empathy and just really see games as, you know, art forms made by people. And then whatever you think past yeah. that is, is fine, but just really like reminding yourself that they're made by people. And, and then I guess the second part, um, oh, what was the second part? I got too caught up in the people now. <laughs> wish this to wish Yeah, quick plug, like subscribe <laughs> to the channel. Um, I guess like not, um, yeah, like seeing a game as not such a critical investment because like, you know, people um, will go have lunch at like Nando's and like happily spend $25 on lunch and like in a blink of an eye and it could even be a, a, like a crap meal, but then th they'll still not really care. Like it just has this sort of like instant gratification, filling my body with tasty food. It's fine. It was worth it. And then they pay $25 on a game that gives them a hundred hours of pleasure. And then they're still bitter and they're still got like, you know, they're still like saying, Oh, I hate this game. And I just find it really interesting how, just how whack like the sense of value is in the game design industry i've always felt it's just so weird like it's just so offset from so many other art forms i'm sure the movie industry probably think the similar way but saying it though like movie industries have typically much higher profits than games but um but even then it's just like yeah i, I guess people you know w when you're buying an indie game like maybe don't be so so critical of your investment and think of your investment less as a, an investment of your own time and like a piece of your own value being detached from you as a person and think that you are enabling someone to to make something better for you like you're investing in that game and that game will in turn be better and it'll be a better experience for you yeah. there's always exceptions to the rule there's, there's some indie developers that are bad and they make bad games and do bad things with lots of money um but for the most case like you know like we're real people that have emotions <laughs> and, and we're trying to do the right thing and we're trying to do the right thing by everybody yeah. So I guess it's like tr trying not to be so critical because I, I think most people, when they really think about what they value, um, games is like the cheapest investment that they'll ever make in their entire life as far as like how much time they're spending playing the games that they're actually buying. Yeah, for sure. Like I think I'm learning that. Like I think when I first started YouTube and I've always been interested in the game dev world and and the basis of selling games and i've always been interested in how critically you know games were received and stuff and it has taken me a long time to maybe realize like how much effort goes into making games and and understanding a little bit more and and yeah it's like you said equating worth to the game time and and ex, you know comparing that to a meal and stuff that's something that's probably only the last couple of years I've, I've realized yeah i've got to be a little bit easier sometimes when when taking a look at certain things or or doing stuff um so yeah i, I totally understand that one other than that, what's been your favourite game this year? Like, just to finish off on a note, so don't take up too much of your time. Um, but, like, what other stuff have you been doing? Has it all just been Lens Island? Like, what do you normally generally kick back and play when you're not game devin? <laughs> yeah, look, I, I do not play games. <laughs> For the past three or four years, like, I just I just don't get the luxury of playing games anymore. Sounds like there's me. There's one game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's not there's... the YouTube channel, if it's not a survival game, I just don't have time to play it. it like, it's got to be work-related yeah. now. I just, I wish I had more time. It's just so ironic because it's like my love for games is what got me into game design. Yeah. And then since designing games, I don't play games. Um, but yeah, I think the, the only game that I played a tiny bit of is... Um, there's a game called Skater XL because I skated my whole childhood. I, right. really, I really like skateboarding games. So there's been this, a game called Skater XL, and yeah, then I'll see sometimes when I'm finished for the day, I'll play five minutes of that, and then I'll and then I'll get back to work. Yeah. Um, but that's it. That that's the extent of my gaming these days. So I'm very much looking forward to one day in the future being able to like sit back and then play like a rust wipe or something again. yeah like that just would get back be into glorious it. that's what i felt like i've recently played skyrim uh, again obviously and uh terraria as well we had a big update on console yeah. so and them two games i i loved like for years and and put so much time into but i hadn't played them in ages and i have just been doing nothing but play certain types of games and it does make you a bit jaded and so it's been really mm. nice dipping into a, an old game that i really used to love and and being able to make content on it as well as as has been something mm. pretty good so yeah i totally feel you on that one uh, and then lastly marmite versus vegemite like 
Come on now. <laughs> it's, it's, Is that even a question? It's got to be Marmite, surely. I know you're Australian, no. but like, you know, I'm going to send you a box of Marmite. <laughs> no, I, I haven't got any big actual opinions about this, but it's often what I see argued most um, between Aussies and uh, Pommies. Right, right. Uh, look, I I veg my own toast almost every morning. Right, so, so you're you, definitely you'd be a veg white camp. Get me con convert. Yeah, I, I'm definitely in that camp. <laughs> that would be good. All right, thank you so much, Julian. Really appreciate it, mate. Uh, Lens Island coming out 26 November. Go and wishlist it. Early access. They are hopefully going to be able to add multiplayer, or they're thinking about it. It's definitely the biggest feedback, and they've obviously got big plans for it. And I really appreciate your time today, mate. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. No worries. Thank you. All right, later's rat bags. Bye bye.